up the screen, you'll see our sports ministry. We are proud of them. They won trophy again last year. They got the number one, and now they are the runner-up. And how many must know the winner are those that really enjoy the game? It's, it's actually, the, the main thing is fellowship. We give God a hand for these people. They have their trophy at hand, a blaze camp. If you bring a non-believer, you pay 200, and uh, you also, uh, the non-believers will pay 200. You've got to be in a beautiful place, cheerful school, out on the mountain, big place, very clean, very beautiful, and uh, the weather is just almost perfect. And the theme is brilliant stock. If you sign up early and you pay only 300, it's already subsidized when it is 350. Yeah, you get an early bird special, okay? And uh, Senior Club, June the 26th, you've got to learn to use the latest application, especially with regard to the church one. Um, we're going to read some of the testimonies given. Break through beyond my expectations. I would like to thank RLC for organizing so many kingdom classes for me to know God deeper. Throughout Kingdom Surpassing Grace, I've learned a lot, especially in giving thanks and praising the Lord in all areas of my life. Once I practiced it, I kept breaking through in all areas in my life. Praise the Lord for that. I learned to confess prophetic words every day. This really helped me to focus on God's promises and help my faith grow. As I apply what I learned in classes, I experienced many breakthroughs beyond my expectations. I've also learned to surrender everything to our Father. The peace and joy in return are explainable. All glory to you, Father. I praise you forevermore. Happy and energized after the classes. Dear Pastor Joshua and Pastor Kerry, Thank you for organizing this Kingdom series. I was quite reluctant to continue this class when my uni courses started because Wednesday classes were very long. However, I thank God for the motivation to go weekly anyway. God has blessed me with many new friends and a great time each week. I always left the class feeling happy, peaceful and energized for the week. Thank God also for the good teachers and the good messages. It was a privilege to be able to provide food for some of the weeks and learn to be generous and bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Well, praise God. So we're going to have the uh, new term, July the 18th, very soon. And celebration night is going to be June 24th and come and celebrate. All right. Next one, looking forward to the next camp. It's been a fun three-day trip to Cheringin Hills. We play a lot of games and learn many things. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to the next camp. I got to know my destiny. I learned that I am precious to God and I have a hidden treasure inside of me. I want to use my hidden treasure for God's kingdom and glory. Overall, the place had a great view. The games were fun and challenging, which was good because it encouraged teamwork. I made many new friends and they were all amazing. It was fun to discover our hidden treasures together. I want to go for another camp again next year. Oh, praise God. Do sign up for the uh, youth camp. Sunday men out today is Jeremiah 31 verse 16. Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. I remember that we are entering the season of travail. Last uh, year was a month of praise. We saw amazing breakthrough because Psalm 149 tells us our praise is at a two-edged sword. It dealt with a lot of principalities and we see the fruits of it this year. But um, right now, God says we're moving into a season of deep, fervent intercession groaning, but it's not the cry or the tears of uh, self-pity or, or despair, but it is expectation, like a, a woman giving birth, the travail of anticipation. For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and uh, they shall come back from exile, and there's hope in the future, says the Lord, that your children will come back to their own border. In other words, your kids are going to fulfill their destiny. And, uh, you know, Pastor Wittin gave the prophetic word. Our children have a very good future. It's one of the prophecies crystallized here. And we've been praying and we're seeing that coming to pass. And it's because Psalm 5, 12 says, For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. It's a grace and a favor of God. God is see all those uh, prophecy and promises being fulfilled. I mean, the key thing is your tithes and offering. I can never overemphasize the importance of your tithes and offering, the impact it has on our church and how your church can continue to expand different areas because of your faithful giving in your tithes and offering. At the same time, get able to impact missions all over the world. Hello everyone, and welcome home to RLC. If this is your first time here, head down to the Vineyard Lounge to learn more about our ministry here at RLC and get a free gift. 
loving me I put you in control Now I know who's I am No more comparison I'm certain in my soul I'm part of your plan My life's in your hands You're the reason that my heart can sing No longer my own You sit at the throne You are ruler over everything I want less of me So you would increase Make me like your son I want more A new study space is now open for students aged 18 and above on weekdays from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. For weekly updates and sermon notes, you can download our app. Just search for Renewal Lutheran Church. Follow us on Instagram at Oasis of Care and Ablaze RLC. Father, we thank you for this uh, wonderful morning in the name of Jesus Christ. We rebuke and bind every foul, wicked, evil spirit. We could go from here right now in Jesus' name that your word may have free codes in the midst of us and other people say, Amen. Now, today, of course, uh, is Father's Day. We are celebrating the goodness, the blessings that Father has in our everyday life. But, of course, some of you uh, might have uh, quite a, some kind of experience uh, with your father because we are living in an imperfect world, and maybe you feel your dad is a bit hard, or maybe harsh, or perhaps uncaring, insensitive, and not doing right. But in this way, your father is like that, may well be the grandfather is like that. Your grandfather is like that, may well be the great-grandfather is like that, and it could well trace all the way back to our common ancestor, which of course is Adam, because we are living in a broken, imperfect world. But the good news today, as we celebrate Father's Day, that you can be the generation that break the cycle of pain and bitterness when you do the right thing. And today we're going to explore three generations. We'll look at the grandfather, King Saul, and then look into the son, which is Jonathan, and then we can look at the grandson, Mephibosheth, and uh, see how Mephibosheth's destiny was changed because Jonathan chose to be different and he broke the chain of bitterness and pain in that generation so that the curse is not passed to the fourth generation as depicted in the Old Testament. Uh, King Saul was a man with a high calling Man, the Bible tells us he's head and shoulder above all the rest. And he's gifted, he has ability, he has a real calling. But unfortunately, uh, he lost his calling because he didn't do things God's way. He was walking ahead of God and, uh, and he became, in the end, very insecure. And when the news that David killed 10,000, only uh, he killed 1,000, he was mad with depression Jealousy coming after David. Hey, put it this way. I'm going to know if the next generation is better than us. It shows that you're a good mentor. So one of the roles as pastor 
is to raise up the next generation. If the next generation is better, I'm as happy as can be. Uh, one time, Pastor Bernard, they prophesied over joy. Man, you could have seven times stronger anointing than your dad. <laughs> I'm not upset, I'm, I'm happy because the next generation should be better. Not only uh, Bernard, but also other pastor, Irvin, Vernon, uh, Dina Garan, professor, the same thing, and not just on joy, so many others. Hey, Hammermans know that when the next generation is better, it shows that we as mentors are doing our job. We should be as happy as can be. But not King Saul. He was in depression and difficult to come and sing songs. <laughs> and uh, when the praise is offered to God, the evil spirit. And how many must know that jealousy and insecurity is demonic? And so as the praise goes up, the demon go from Saul. And uh, last year, we have a, a season of praise, a month of celebration of praise. And Psalm 149 tells us that praise is a two-edged sword. Now, put it this way, your praise does not make God big. Your praise makes your consciousness of God become bigger. And you're going to be able to have faith to really deal with all the challenges. And what happened is that Saul walked uh, in his own way, walked ahead of God. As a result, he was killed in a place called Gibua. Later on, people took him to this place called Bashan. And every time in the Holy Land tour, we would pass by uh, this particular town called Bashan. And he was hung somewhere up on one of the walls here. What a pathetic ending. He was a guy who was head and shoulder. Above all, he was handsome. He was fair. He was well liked by the people. But because of his ugly choices, he found himself dead. And then when the news came that he was dead, the whole household was, of Saul was in turmoil. Because in those days, when the new dynasty of king came, the previous family got to be slaughtered and killed. And so the nurse, with good motive, uh, took the son, Mephibosheth, in her hand and ran for her life and accidentally dropped. Mephibosheth, as a result, was lame, crippled in both his legs. As a matter of fact, his name, Mephibosheth, means broken by shame, broken by confusion. Yet, towards the end of his life, you find Mephibosheth, you know, meant to be exterminated and killed, he was dining at the king's table. What has happened? Because Jonathan chose to make a difference. He did something. And today I want to share with you how you can bring blessing, not curses, to the next generation. Maybe your dad is hard. Maybe your dad is harsh. You don't have to be hard. You don't have to be harsh, uncaring, insensitive. You can draw the line on the sand today and say, I will make a difference like Jonathan did. So I'm going to share with you how you can make a difference. Mothers and fathers. You know, number one, how did Jonathan cause the blessing to flow? in his generation, where that generation supposed to be cursed. Remember the Bible tells us that the sins of the father could have passed on to the second, third, and fourth generation. How did Jonathan did, and how can we release blessing to the next generation? Number one, receive the kindness of your father. Second Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Now David say, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David is a picture of the father, all right? And he wants to show his kindness to his children for the sake of Jonathan. What happened is that Jonathan recognized the calling of uh, David and he began to make a covenant. Now, those days, uh, in the Hebrew uh, language, when you want to make a covenant, you actually, the literally in the Hebrew, you cut a covenant. Now, this is practiced even in modern day. Uh, among the Chinese and Japanese gangs. When they want to be blood brothers, what they do is that they come together and they, they cut the tip of the finger, drop blood into the bowl of water, and then uh, the other party also cut the tip of the finger, drop the blood into the pool, uh, a bowl of water, and they mix the blood and they will drink. And they become blood brothers. That's how they cut a covenant. That's even today when you make modern day contracts, lawyers will tell you you've got to be stamped with a red seal. I think its origin is how the Hebrew people cut a covenant. You know, how many of you have heard of uh, David Livingston? He was a great missionary to Africa. 
And remember, he was the one that discovered the Victoria Fall. How many of you have been to the Victoria Fall? <laughs> it's uh, amazing. He was a missionary. And one time, when he discovered Victoria Fall, he has only one hand, the left hand, because the right hand was torn apart by a lion. And uh, one time he was dying, uh, malaria, and people asked him, you have a great career, you have a medical doctor, you have great riches in England, why do you come? To, at that time, it's called the dark continent of Africa. He said, it's because of a smoke of a thousand villages, because of vision. And as fathers, it's important for us to impart vision to the next generation. Man, no matter how old you may be, when you have vision, you're going to be sharp, you're going to be agile, and you will have a purpose to raise up the next generation. When the next generation is better than you, you'll be as, as secure, as happy you can be. And he said, because of the smoke in a thousand villages. And he said, my heart is in Africa. When uh, David Livingstone died, uh, all England cried. And they brought the body to be buried in a chapel, a very famous place in England called Westminster Abbey, where many of the kings of England were crowned. It was buried in this sacred place. But you know, it is a body without a heart. Because just when they took the body of Livingstone away, the native come because they heard that Livingston's heart is for Africa. They took, they cut off the body and took the heart and buried it somewhere in Africa. So even you go there to honor David Livingston, you realize it is a body without the heart because his heart in Africa. And one time he was lost and no news of him. And uh, England sent a guy called Sir uh, Stanley, Henry Stanley to go and look for Livingston with a team of people. And he was confronted, not just with the problem with the natural terrain, but there was a tribe of people. They were hostile. They were standing their way. And Stanley, Dr. Stanley, uh, Sir Stanley was not able to get through. But a local interpreter told them how to build that rapport and relationship with this tribe of people. They said, you send a representative, and the chief, the tribal chief, said the representative, and both of you will cut your wrists. And the blood will drop into a bowl of wine, mix it, and you drink. And after that, when they did that, the tribal chief have confidence in Stanley, allowed Stanley to pass through and even do business with them. Now, I'm not asking you guys to start cutting your wrists. I remember that you don't need to cut the risk anymore because Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago has already shed blood for us in which we celebrate in Holy Communion this cup is the new covenant in my blood wine pour out for you the blood of Christ uh, for you for the forgiveness of all your sin and exactly what uh, Jonathan did Jonathan is a picture of Jesus Christ he cut a covenant look at uh, 1 Samuel 18 verse 3 to 4 then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David, with his armor, even to his sword, and his bow, and his belt. Now, Hammer must know, you notice that the local interpreter for Sir Stanley understand the culture of his time. It's important for us when we apply Bible truth to understand the culture. There's a reason why our kingdom series is cultural sensitive. For example, in our kingdom relationship class, the principles there, the Bible keys there, are adapted to our local culture because we don't understand the culture, we're not able to apply Bible truth in the, our cultural context. So it's not something Western scheme of Bible study we import in. It is something that has been adopted in our local context and way with the new course, Kingdom Core Values, which can be used in businesses because it has been adapted to our local business uh, entrepreneurs' need according to the Bible in the proper context. Back to the covenant here. Because of the covenant, one day, I can imagine David was having a good time. He was eating his, uh, perhaps, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken or maybe a, some kind of a thing uh, with a glass of wine. He was as happy as anything. And while he was eating, he saw the incision in his hand. He saw the cut in his hand. He remembered the covenant that he has made with Jonathan. He rose up and said, I'm not going to be happy sitting down, enjoying all the luxury. Is there anyone in the household of Saul, unworthy that he was, that I may show kindness for the sake of Jonathan? You know, the Bible tells us that 
the sins of the father passed down to the fourth generation. And uh, sometimes preachers still preach that. Oh, but it's the Bible. Yeah, but how many must know that the cross changes everything? Say the cross changes everything. Because that curse is broken. Because Jesus Christ, the greater Jonathan, has cut his body. He's given his life for us. He took our curse. And friends, let me say this. You may come from a hard background. Your dad is a hard man. You don't have to be hard and harsh to the next generation. You can once and for all draw the line on the sand and say, enough, it is enough. I'm going to pass blessing to my next generation. Pastor, I try to, don't try. <laughs> Receive his kindness. You mean as you receive his kindness, you get that grace to pass down the kindness to the next generation. Number two, how can we as fathers break the curse of what we have gone through in our everyday life from what we experience from our heart, Father? Number two, you got to hear, declare what the king says. Second Samuel chapter 9, verse 3. And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Ziba is one of the servants of Saul, and it was called to tell the king, is there anyone in the house of Saul? And Ziba said, yes, there is a son of Jonathan, but he is lame in his feet. And Ziba said, O oh, king, he is living in Lodabar. You know, Lodabar means no pasture, no vegetation, no fruit, no grain. Nothing, barren land. If you go to Lodabar today, you find it is an arid, barren place. And verse 5. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amel, from Lodabar. I, I can imagine when uh, Mephibosheth heard strange footsteps outside his house, he got to say, hey, what is that? And Ziba came, oh, Mephibosheth, the king is coming to take you. I can imagine Mephibosheth would say to himself, maybe today my luck has finally ran out. Man, I'm going to be slaughtered. I'm going to be exterminated. It's finished. And as the soldiers came and carried Mephibosheth to the king's palace, I believe uh, Mephibosheth felt like it is the longest day in his life. And then when he reached the king, verse 6, now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had came to David, he fell on his feet and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Here is your servant. You know, what David saw, when he cried out, Mephibosheth, in the Hebrew means broken by shame, broken by confusion. Nothing can prepare David for the shock that is Saul. You know, he knows Saul. He, David knew Saul. His former boss. His head and shoulder above all the rest. He talked like a king. He carried himself with dignity as a king. Everything in King Saul marks royalty. But nothing can prepare him. The way he saw. He said, Ziba, you said you brought Mephibosheth. Where is he? Where is it? You say you brought Mephibosheth and uh, one of the sons of King Saul. Where is he? Ziba said, look down. And he looked down. There was this guy crawling on the floor, lame in both legs. Emaciated like a dead dog, crawling to him, begging for mercy. What sin can ravage the next generation? Why did Mephibosheth has gone to such a pathetic situation, a state like a dead dog? Interesting, the word Lodabar does not only mean no pasture, no vegetation, no ground, no fruit. Lodabar, you remember Debar means spoken word. Debar. Remember we talk about confessing the word of God, the Debar of God. Lord of Bar means no word. And the reason why, and if you look at the screen, the Lord of Bar also means no word, no prophetic utterance, no vision, as it is out, no inheritance. Why Mephibosheth has no word? 
has no inheritance. It all started when he was being carried by the nurse in frozen in fear. You see, what happened was that the nurse, good motive, good intention, that she was, but she was believing a lie. The lie that the king, the new king David, is after him. And Hammer must know that we can be crippled and frozen by believing a lie. The same way today, many people they don't have a good picture of God, and sometimes it's the fault is us preachers. We are still shouting and screaming the fourth generation curse because of what we have done of our sins. You recall a testimony by Joseph Prince. He was sharing how this couple came asking for prayer to be healed because they were barren without child. What happened is that they have gone to another guy, and said, "Sir, would you pray for us?" The guy said, "Do you have sex before marriage?" And of course, the couple confess, and the, and the guy say, "Oh, that's it, because of your sin. Now pass down." And、uh, Pastor Prince said, "This guy is not a preacher. He's a rascal, because he's robbing people's blessing by painting a wrong picture of God." Remember, God said to Moses, "Speak to the rock." And Moses strike the rock and get angry with the people, and、uh, God said, "Because of that, you dishonor me. Before the people, you will not enter the land, because Moses, in his anger, in his rage, was condemning the people whom God wanted to save. Man, sometimes it's the wrong picture of God that we have, and many of us like Murphy Bushe, we are broken." Because we listen to what the circumstances say, or what even well-meaning people say. Sometimes we do it unconsciously, like wait till your daddy come home. What are we kind of bringing out a picture of our daddy? The kids will grow up fearful of the daddy, waiting for the daddy to come home. Look, man, the <laughs> pastor is visiting your home. Man, he's after you. He's trying to catch something you have done. Oh, pastor is going around the cafe because he's finding fault. Oh, a pastor is going around the Sunday school because he is after the people in the Sunday school, checking on them, see any fault. What kind of a picture we have? See, the point is that what you fear, you hate. See, when we project the image of the father as so frightful, you're going to hate your dad. And、uh, over the months, you're going to build up that kind of a wrong thinking, thinking that your dad is against you. Your God is against you, and、uh, what you hate is that what you're going to not going to be able to get breakthrough. You're not going to be able to receive things from God, from your pastor, or from your dad. And sometimes we fathers also say the wrong word. I mean, of course, we're going to discipline our children, but we need to draw the line on the sand. There are certain things we will not tolerate. I remember some time ago, Joy was, I think, in primary school, came back crying. He said, "Why are you crying, Joy?" Oh, because. Uh, the teacher said, "I'm stupid." Now, if she didn't do her homework, I would be the first to discipline her. But I draw the line in the sand. They cross the line when they say, "You stupid, you useless, you're a failure." I straight away the next morning go to the school, straight to the headmaster's office, and say, "Of course, I didn't say I'm a pastor. <laughs> I say I'm an educationalist, which I am. All right,、uh, I wrote so many books. I say if she, the teacher, say one more word." I've got to report this to the education department. And so far, no,、uh, the teacher never repeat that word. I think the, the principal would have given a piece of her mind、uh, to that particular teacher. Hammer must know your word can cripple a child. It's important for us to to say the right word. Never say you stupid, you useless, you amount to nothing. Hey, Hammer must know we are putting curses. But David is about to say something that could change a life. Of Murphy Bushay, Second Samuel chapter nine verse seven. So David said to him, "Do not fear." Do not fear. Hey, we need fathers to be like that. When the kids come back full of fear, that I don't have what it takes to do the examination because he didn't study, because he didn't work hard. No, cut off those things, and say, "Do not fear." Ask the kid to say, "I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me," and David said, "I will surely show you kindness." He didn't say, "I will show you kindness." If you do your homework, I'll show you kindness. 
Uh, when you behave well, I'll show you kindness. If you're not naughty, no. David said, I'll show you kindness for the sake of Jonathan, your father. Hey, how many of us know the same way? God will show us kindness, not because of how good we are, but because of how good our God is. And David said, I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather. That is the heart of God, the kindness of God. He wants to restore everything that's been lost. And you will eat bread at my table continually. And other people say, interestingly, if you look at the story, that immediately after Jesus cleansed the temple, remember they were doing buying and selling and money changing. That's why we don't encourage businesses among care members or church members because this is the house of God, not a place to do business. All right? Do business in the world, not in the house of God, in the care meeting. And um, Jesus says out, because, why? Because they get the wrong picture of God. Instead of a house of prayer, seeking God, they become something to get them, cheating them, a den of robbers. What kind of a picture of God they have colored because of their activities? I noticed that when the temple was cleansed and our mind is renewed at the right picture of God, the Bible tells us the lame and the sick and the crippled were healed. Matthew 21 verse 14. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. There was then, say then, just after Jesus cleansed the temple. You know, the Bible tells us we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, our mind, got to be renewed. Don't believe the lie. I mean, sometimes all these are innocent people, the nurse, they want to take care of Murphy Boucher innocently was frozen in fear because he was believing a lie. And um, when our mind is being renewed by the Word of God, this is important. That's why we encourage you to join the Kingdom Series, not for my sake, for your sake. All right, we have new causes, Kingdom Covenanted Blessing, Call Value, Kingdom Discovery. You notice that Daniel chapter 6 tells us, Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel was 85 years old, right? Call out retirement to serve the king. Four kings in two world empire. What is the key to Daniel's amazing blessing? Because Daniel was diligent in seeking, searching the scripture. As you do when you do the kingdom classes. Daniel chapter 9. And as Daniel searched the scripture, he began to realize there's going to be an end of desolation. Say the person right, there could have been an end to desolation. How many of us know your setbacks are never final? What is final are the promises of God. It's important for us to know what God has promised. That's why the kingdom covenanted promises are important. It is something that covenanted for us, committed for us. All right. When the scriptures say there's going to be an end of desolation, when Daniel looked around, he was still in exile. He can still smell the Babylonian air. He can still hear the Persian language being spoken. Everything's the same. But you know what? Daniel prayed, declared, he spoke and prayed in line with what God says. You know what? The Bible tells us Daniel prospered. And I believe that uh, as intercessors, not all of us are called to be intercessors. It's important for us to speak what God says. Years ago, Pastor Bernard prophesied, our children have a very good future. When we look around at that time, it's like, wow, quite challenging. But now we're seeing it coming to pass, that our children have a very good future. But intercessors, keep focusing on what God says, not what we see Keep on focusing on what God says and pray. But the best prayer is praying in tongues. Don't, don't pray too, too much in your known language, uh? be it English, Japanese, or whatever language, uh? Hokkien, yeah. Just commit the item, declare God's word, and go straight into the tongue. One of the most powerful prayer is groaning tongue. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26. But why is the Spirit also helped us in our weaknesses? If we didn't know how we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. One of the most amazing uh, 
tongues is groaning tongue because you're birthing God. You're not crying in despair. You're not crying in self pity. As what the Bible said, do not cry. But it is the, it is the groaning of anticipation, like the child being born, and, and, the, and the mother is groaning in travail in anticipation. I remember years ago, about almost 25 years ago, but it is. Uh, guy that came and today he's a key leader of our church he was just a few days ago he was testifying how he came to know the Lord what I meant at that time he was working for a man boss and a lady boss the lady boss has been asking him to come to church many times but he didn't want to come and uh, on, the, on the Thursday evening he was driving the man boss from App station out of the blue the man boss said can you come to church this Sunday he was astounded because he never realized that this man boss was also a believer. It doesn't really look like one. <laughs> but he was amazed. He said, yes, I'll come. On that very night when they were driving back from the outstation, that lady boss was in the prayer meeting, praying, groaning, travailing fervently in tongue. I remember that. I remember vividly she was on the floor groaning, not tears of self-pity, not tears of despair. But the son of Mena today says, do not clear, do not weep, do not cry. But it was a groaning of anticipation, a fervent prayer. And that Sunday, he and the family came to the church and opened their heart, the whole family received Jesus Christ. The effect of that intercessor overspew to another family of the same surname. <laughs> How much of your intercession is powerful? And other people say, that's why it's important for us as intercessors and all of us are intercessors not to speak what we see. Like one of the words that given to the church is to raise up entrepreneurs. 30 years ago, if we were to count the number of entrepreneurs, it can be counted on the palm of our hand. But today, just we have many entrepreneurs. One of them has been voted the 50, among the 50 most influential business entrepreneurs in Asia. How many must know this church, God is raising up entrepreneurs and other people say, and pray in line. We look at the natural intercessors, don't look at the natural and speak the natural. The same way God said He's going to raise up a center of Davidic worship. It was given by Pastor Prince a long time ago, 1996. Pastor Joshua, Pastor Kerry, you shall build for me a center of Davidic worship. An anointing on you both shall be great for leadership. You shall teach about worship. You shall teach about flowing in anointing like never before. I'm bringing you higher. Now you're restoring the temple with worship and praise. Years ago, you look at this our church, you find, hey, how could it be? But right now we see the praise night. Amazing anointing being released. Just today, the worship was just awesome. The anointing was great. And I was looking at the, the chat in regards to the uh, musician they have active chat and our music director Lois was exhorting them he said man we could have grace 101 make sure that the lyrics of the song must be grace centered and this is a unique feature of our church praise worship is Christ centered and grace centered it is not just copies of some western group no we have that calling because we want to have the hundredfold blessing, we're not satisfied with just 30% grace. We want to have 100% grace, and other people say, Amen. And then anointed to bring revival among young people as intercessors, we got to pray. We got to pray in line with this uh, prophetic word and begin to speak into it. Yes, God has anointed us to bring revival among young people. I'm calling you to bring revival among the young people. That means the youth and the young adults, and they will touch the masses the media, airwaves, and all areas of the arts. People are going to learn how to sing, how to play music, how to do worship, how to dance, how to act. Out of this church will come CD, DVDs, what I'm doing. And, and Morris is asking uh, Joyce uh, DVD to be shown in the television in the States, and they will be distributed to churches around the world. But I call you to be a church that write music, to be a church that knows what is it to break through in worship. It's a bit uniqueness, unique thrust of our church. It's a music which is Christ-centered, all right? And of course, the anointed, the race of entrepreneurs that was given by Pastor Prince years ago, many will come in and, and say, 
Pastor, teach us the ways of the Lord. I have tried the ways of the world. Now what Saul did? The ways of the world destroy him. It is not work. I have lost my family. I have lost that which I value most. Teach me the ways of the Lord. They shall become a mighty pillar that will cause others, other business men to see my glory. And they will bring in those of the influence into the church and they will become mighty pillars because they know it was you through the grace of God. Entrepreneur colored with grace, 100% grace. And we are calling people that are going to be the rapid response in the sessions because the season in Bonnet Birds, we pray fervently. We are birthing something new and uh, three things once you sign up, very simple, just uh, in the, the telephone here, put it into your contact list. When it is an alert, the last week we have a, a drill, a couple of alerts, and I was amazed that people come. You can do three things. Number one, you can pray under your breath, wherever you may be. Number two, you can go one side, in the business, company, or in your home, and start praying. The topic, the alert item we give you. On number three, you go straight to church, and we have a good number. <laughs> last week, Tuesday and Thursday, when we have the drill, and there's more than a through. We are really praising, believing fervently that God is going to birth something new in our life, you say. And in conclusion, look at second, uh, same image of the 9, verse 11. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's son. You know, um, he can't expect him to be a servant. But became a son. He came with no inheritance. It was in Lodabar. But he has now a great inheritance. Verse 12. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was crippled in both feet. What an amazing ending. Mephibosheth lived. Say Mephibosheth lived. He was a guy whose name means broken by shame and confusion because of the lies that he received. Perhaps on a well-meaning servant, a nurse, that crushed him when he was five years old because she was believing a lie. And sometimes we are crushed by all those lies. But right now, because of what Jonathan did, Mephibosheth lived because he always at at the king's table. He was crippled in both feet. When I read this particular passage, I was a, a, a bit angry and upset. I say, the writer has messed up the story. Why did he end such a beautiful story in such a negative way? He was crippled in both his leg. We all know Mephibosheth was broken, both leg was broken, he was crippled, he was leg. But why do you have to end the story? He was crippled in both his feet. I'll tell you why next week. And um, it is very important, right? Is that the ending of Mephibosheth? You can imagine perhaps one day Mephibosheth was having a great time at the king's table, munching his way on a perhaps a drumstick or glass of beautiful exotic wine then in the distance he saw a guy coming in not dressed properly shabbily dressed and almost can smell the sting on his body if ever she was angry and is about to stand up and say how dare you come to the king's palace dressed like this smelling stinging and this when the feeble just stood up he realized he was still lame in both his legs. He realizes that he was there at the king's table. Not because how good he is, but because how good his father Jonathan was. And David said, is there anyone in the household of Saul that can show kindness for the sake of Jonathan? In the same way, you don't have to cut your wrist, cut the tip of the finger, to cut that covenant 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ already cut the covenant because he said, this is my body broken for you.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Would you uh, pray this prayer together with me, dear Lord Jesus? Thank you for being my good shepherd. Right now, I receive you into my life as my shepherd, as my Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I know, even I make bad choices, you are with me, you are for me, and you will sort things out for me, because you are the good shepherd. Who have already laid down your life for me, and all the people say, Amen. Amen. Say that prayer and want to know more or have any feedbacks, please write to us. 